Um, hello again, I guess. And thanks, Sarah, for taking over when, you know, it's a Murphy's Law Day. Um, so as I was mentioned, I'm trying to drill it into everyone right now, I guess, um, is that, you know, throughout this 30 minute um, short um, sharing, I hope you understand, you know, you are able to take um, away what the taste of, of design sprint entails and also explore how it could potentially be applied in your own organization. So just a little bit about myself, I'm currently a UX instructor at General Assembly and a partner at AI Shophouse Consultancy specializing in design thinking as well as UX design. So having implemented design sprints across multiple industries, including education, public safety and trade finance, I'm happy to be able to share um, with my experience about implementing design sprints with you today. So having that short introduction, let's right, get right into it on what a design sprint is. So essentially, a design sprint is a structured process that enables a cross-functional team of six to eight people to work together to solve complex problems in a short amount of time. So this design sprint process was developed by ex-Googlers Jake Knapp, John Jaratsky, as well as uh, Braden Kowitz, um, and it was adopted for Google Ventures for the um, startups that were under their portfolio. So the thing about startups is that it tends they tend to have limited resources and a limited runway to get things right. So a design sprint process was actually the best, the right fit for them because it allows them to get results and to test ideas um, in a short amount of time before they can actually they decide to commit to them. So true design sprints, teams benefit from having effective collaboration in a time box and structured process. In a sprint team, usually an optimal size of a sprint team would be six to eight people. And this allows them to actually contribute um, ideas as well as opinions in a very meaningful way. And they also feel very vested in terms of the sprint outcomes. Um, secondly, because they are actually focusing on a single challenge, they are able to develop a solution and evaluate it from different perspectives for feasibility and potential. And therefore, this increases the chances that this solution or this idea will be successful. Third, as I mentioned, um, the ability to test these ideas before committing resources to build is a great one to have, especially for companies with limited resources. So with that in mind, let's jump dive deep into what each of, um, in terms of the design sprint process. So as mentioned, it is a five day process. It is a full day. Um, so a design sprint typically starts from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day, and it covers through five days of um, work. Each of the design sprint has a different theme, and this mimics the design thinking um, from problem discovery as well as solution design. So we typically start a design sprint on a Monday where we start to set goals for the whole sprint as well as for the team. And secondly, we also try to do discovery of the problem space. Through activities such as expert interviews, we the team actually gets an in-depth understanding of the subject matter or of the problem space uh, from experts. So from there, this creates a common ground where teams can take off and move on to the other stages of the design sprint. At the end of the first day, what they will do is to decide a focal point or a single challenge for ideation and problem solving. So bringing the challenge into the second day is where all the ideas will come. So the team will actually um, do a brainstorming through a process called the four-step sketch, where they will work alone together. Now, this concept is an interesting one because um, they are encouraged to work individually so that there is time for them to develop ideas as well as get inspiration and to also think deeper into the problem space itself. This also prevents grouping where the team comes together to form a single solution. So the resulting um, outcome is that on Tuesday, you get diverse um, ideas that can work to solve the solution or to solve the problem. 
Once that's done, um, the team will go into Wednesday, which is where they will get to decide on what solution they will be choosing. So at the start of Wednesday, the team will actually put their individual ideas up and conduct an activity called a gallery walk where they will actually need to assess and review each ideas individually again and without talking. What this does is that the ideas will need to speak for themselves and they will need to be self-explanatory because the owner will not be there to actually provide any supporting explanations. Now, the team will then assess and then choose the idea that has the highest potential of addressing the sprint challenge as well as the sprint goal itself. An activity called storyboarding will be followed uh, where the team actually aligns on how the solution will be used in terms of the problem space context. Come Thursday, the team will actually split up into different roles to actually produce a mock-up of the solution to be tested on the intended usage. So this is where you create a Goldilocks quality type of solution to test out and communicate the concept to potential users. Now, we call it Goldilocks because we don't want to spend too much time on it because if we spend too much effort on building this prototype, what happens is that we fear that the team will get too vested to pivot away from the initial solution or to iterate on it. The interviewer, which will be conducting the usability testing or the user testing, will also be doing the scripting of the test and will do the trial run for the testing for the next day. Now we've come to the last day of the design sprint, and this is where the truth is revealed, right? Because it is the testing of the idea or the solution with potential users. Well, we will be doing qualitative testing with five users. And during this testing, we will be giving, or we will be presenting the prototype to the user and ask them to perform a series of tasks while thinking out loud as much as possible. The interviewer is encouraged to ask open questions so that the users will actually be able to provide them as honest an opinion as possible. Now, behind the scenes, the rest of the sprint team is there observing and taking notes of the users' reactions and thoughts. At the end of the day, all these insights will be aggregated and used to be used for informing the next step of the solution. Now, as you can see, this, the design sprint process is actually quite simple, but it is really intensive. So it's of utmost importance that you assemble a team that is able to, you know, to be purpose-driven as well as who is vested in the outcomes of the design sprint. In every team, there should be a facilitator who is responsible for driving the agenda of the overall sprint process. This not only means that they are managing time, but they are also encouraging each sprint team member to have full participation and also encourage and establish mutual understanding within the team. They will also need to be taking down notes and creating group artifacts as well as the shared memory. Now, you will also need one or two deciders who will be the decision maker for the whole sprint. This is like the CEO of the whole sprint. And they, when there are any decisions to be made during the sprint, these decisions will be deferred to the deciders. This helps to ensure that the team does not get stuck or hung up on making decisions and are able to progress with the agenda of the sprint. Once those two roles are decided, you will have, you'll need to find five or six team members from different functions because that is the true value of a design sprint. Bring people from multidisciplinary um, teams together to solve problems. So depending on your problem space, you might have one or more of these experts that we listed here or even none at all. 
Now, you might be thinking, are all problems suitable for a design sprint? Um, it is likely so, but there are situations whereby, you know, the design sprint is suitable because it can, it can give the best outcomes. So in particular, the design sprint process flourishes where in problem spaces where it would benefit from having multidisciplinary experts or expertise or perspectives. If you are do, thinking about using a design sprint for a visual design problem, it might not be such a great idea because the problem space is really specific and you might be better off getting a team of designers to come in to actually provide some ideas and to decide during that session. Also, design sprints work great when there is a huge potential impact to the customer as well as to your organization. In these scenarios, it is also easier to get buy-in from your management in order to, um, because of the potential return to investment. Now, with all this in place, just do some inherent challenges of every organization that makes design, uh, adapting the design sprint challenging. So the good thing is that the design sprint methodology has been around for some years now and that a lot of teams and organizations have been able to adapt it to their own specific use cases. Um, and these are some of the ones that I've experimented and tried on. So the first challenge comes from small organizations where they your colleagues can't afford to take time away from daily work for a full design sprint. So coming from a startup um, prior, I truly appreciate this challenge. What I've tried to do is to spread activities out in a design sprint over, the, uh, over two weeks and only including the wider team for the activities covered in the first three days. That leaves the prototyping as well as the testing to a product team or a design team. The only catch here is that in order for the team not to lose steam, you will want to complete all the activities within a two-week pe two period and also create an engagement strategy where you will encourage them or you will um, re remind them of the progress that has been made so far. Lastly, you will also need to create a socialization strategy for updating and engaging Spring team members when the testing has been completed and decisions need to be made about the next steps. Secondly, um, a lot of organizations now are fully remote. Now, the original design sprint was designed for a in-person setting where the group will spend time together in an enclosed space for the whole period of the five days. However, with COVID, um, there are now a lot of resources on how you could conduct a remote sprint. One thing is to utilize a virtual whiteboarding tool such as your Miro or Mural or even Figma for the workshop. You need to limit each, each session uh, to a maximum of two hours due to a limited attention spent in a remote setting versus a virtual setting. Another pro tip is that in order to familiarize everyone uh, with the virtual whiteboarding tool, especially if it's their first time, you might want to run an orientation, a short orientation consisting of a game to allow them to utilize different tools of the board. Now, the third challenge comes in huge organizations whereby there are just too many candidates for a sprint. Well, unfortunately, the set truth is, or the, the set um, reality is that you need to be selective. Get recommendations for participants who are looking to proactively contribute and are vested towards the outcomes of the problem space. If needed, you could also include some of these stakeholders as experts on the first days and on the first day during the expert interviews. That, that way, they are still able to contribute fully to the design sprint. Lastly, because it's a huge organization, you want to have a socialization strategy to communicate outcomes to a wider audience. If you're in a legacy organization, chances are that you'll be met with um, siloed ways of working as well as close thinking. 
the way to go about it is probably to go with the grain to put up a proposal indicating the cost benefits of an initiative like this. You could also alternatively start small and slow by adopting small little sprint methods in your regular meetings where decisions need to be made or where brainstorming sessions need to be held, right? The hope is that by introducing these small little steps, your colleagues might see the gains in terms of efficiency and they might put down lower barriers when it comes to adopting new processes. The last one is if it is the problem space is about a physical product or an experience. So a design sprint can be used because a prototype can be digital, it can be an object, or it can be a prototype of space too. If a pamphlet or brochure or pitch deck is one of your marketing channels to get to know about the product, you could also use this to actually test the concept of your idea. Now we've come to the end of this um, sharing, and I hope that you've brought away with you the knowledge that this design sprint methodology is a time box process that empowers cross-functional teams to solve problems effectively, and that each stage of the design sprint works cumulatively to build a common understanding. And lastly, I hope you also take away the fact that a design sprint can be flexible enough and be adapted for organizations of all sorts and sizes. Now, if you're inspired to take the next steps to start adopting this process, I found these resources really useful and I hope you will too. Yeah, and that's it. And I'm happy to open the floor for any questions that I can help to answer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm a big fan of design sprints, so I'm always uh, happy to see when other people are, are kind of picking them up and, and implementing them. So thank you for sharing. I um, love them too, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. If anybody does have any questions, please do just put them into the chat box um, on UXCX or on any of the platforms you're watching, and I'll put those questions through to Elaine. Um, to get started, one of the challenges I've always faced with design sprints, and you, you touched on it, was getting people, like the time commitment from people, because it, it's very hard to, to get it. Now, one of the challenges that I've had is you get the initial commitment, but then when it comes to running the sprint, they're like, oh, well, I have to step out for this meeting I can't miss, or I have to step out for this. So you're getting people kind of dipping in and out throughout the day. So does that happen? for you and then how do you try to solve that and avoid the disruption that that could cause? Absolutely right. Um, yeah, then spot on on this because like I've experienced this uh, quite a little bit um, during my um, experience running design sprints. Um, so it really depends. Um, so what happened was that one of the stakeholders uh, had to run out for a meeting and that was for a few hours. So in those cases, it is still possible to bring them back by, you know, going one on one with them just to let them know what has happened since then. Um, there are also some situations whereby the stakeholder or the participant actually has to go out for a prolonged period of time. In that case, usually we will have to tell them, you know, hey, sorry, but because um, this is a really intensive process and things move really fast, uh, we won't be able to include you back, especially if they are missing the second day. Yeah, because the second day is where your ideas come out. And like, you know, for me, um, if you are not contributing, then it's really difficult to bring you back in. Yeah. But how about yourself? Um, yeah, we've... I've I've actually I've only really worked in one organization that did them um, and it was just they kind of would host them off site was the the solution because mm. that, that helped to kind of this was pre pre COVID. Days, pre COVID. So yeah. <laughs> the office. Um, but that was the solution because we found that if, if it was ever run on site, it was just too easy for people to to step out and or somebody gives a knock on the door because some fire has started and it needs to be addressed immediately. Um, so, so that was the solution was to take people. And it was also, I found a secondary benefit of 
it gets people kind of a bit more free thinking mm. when you're in a new space. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. Um, what kind of frequency would you be running your design sprints at? Um, usually what happens is that after the initial sprint, you might have an iteration cycle. So that's where you probably would have a shorter sprint cycle. Um, you won't need to... It, it, it depends on what the issue is. Maybe you didn't understand the problem enough, or maybe like um, the 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 prototype needs a little bit of tweaking before it's being tested again. So I would say in general, the sprints get shorter and shorter, and until everyone signs off and says that hey, you know, we are ready to develop it, and then it will go into the proper product development process for us. Yeah. Okay, so you, you have a very clear, we've finished, we've signed off this prototype, now it, it moves over, so it's kind of a separation. Yeah, because this this space is really for the concept validation, right? And then once you get done with it, then it should move on to the product development cycle. So okay. that's, that's my experience, yeah. And do you involve the people who ultimately be building it on the development cycle, are they involved at all in the sprints? Usually what we will do, if it's a digital product, we will have um, a tech person, um, be it a developer, or maybe it's, um, we try not to get the CTO. Usually the CTO is really busy, but if he can, then why not? Um, yeah. So the person there, um, or the tech expert there is really responsible for, you know, ascertaining, you know, the feasibility um, of the idea itself. Yeah, so we do include them, but... Um, other than that, only when we go into the product development cycle, then we start to engage more of these uh, of the development team. Great. And can you share a little bit more about the, because you touched on it, that some things don't need to go through a sprint. So how do you balance the, the kind of the workload between, okay, we've decided these things need to go through a sprint, these things don't, and how does that all funnel through and get prioritized when it gets through to delivery? Um, so I think the example I used was that if the challenge or the um, problem space is really um, visual design related. So for example, if you're looking at what is the best layout for a certain website. So these usually are very niche areas where a multidisciplinary team does not actually um, provide much additional value. And therefore, it shouldn't be in the design sprint. So um, in, in my experience, it usually works best when it is a bigger um, issue and that impacts the organization goals. Because in that case, people become more vested in it and they are more vested in the outcomes as well. That's how you get people to come together to solve a problem. Yeah. 